Yes, and welcome to Download This Show here on ABC iView or YouTube as well. If you're watching it on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. I don't know where the button is, but if it's there, you should hit it. And this week on the show, they call it the fappening. Yes, you can't not talk about this. The unbelievable leaking of hundreds of nude photos of female celebrities. Exactly how did it happen to the best of our knowledge and what can it possibly mean for you? Plus, can you imagine a wire that you plug into your phone that doesn't just charge your phone, but it also backs up your phone at the same time? But we're gonna start with Freeview Plus. There's about to be a huge change coming to your television. It's called HBBTV. Just what the hell does that stand for? You're about to find out. Please, let me introduce our panel for this week, he is a senior editor at CNET. Nick Healy, welcome back. Thank you. And she is the editor of PC Mag Australia and the editor at large for techly.com.au. Claire Porter, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Now, HBB TV, it's also known as Freeview Plus. This is uh, from Freeview, who are the peak organisation for free to wear channels. And what they're talking about doing is installing a bit of software on new TVs that combines all of the great ways of watching TV. So, live TV, obviously, uh, then uh, changing TV so you can pause, rewind, fast forward TV. And and then also the catch-up services, so you know things like ABC iView, uh, 10 Play, SBS On Demand, actually folding that in to your television. So Nick Healy, walk me through how this is going to work. Look, it's going to be quite interesting, I think. So HBB TV is hybrid bro broadband broadcast TV. And really it's just meaning that you'll have a single electronic program guide that you'll be able to move backwards on and ca do catch-up TV directly from when you'd normally change channels for live TV. I'm pretty gung-ho about the concept because what it'll do is wrap in all of the catch-up apps that you're already using. So like your iView, 10 Play, yes, those ones. Yep. Uh, SBS On Demand. Yes. And what it does is instead of you having to say, oh, I missed a show, I'll go and get the app or I'll jump on a tablet, it's all integrated into this one EPG. So you can scroll back up to seven days and then say, oh, that was three days ago, missed it, click, and it'll launch the catch-up version of it. Now, how many different TVs can you already get this on? Because that's kind of built into this idea. Because, you know, I've got a TV that we bought, I reckon, five years ago. How do I get it to do this? You don't. Ah, right. Okay, so here you we found the first problem. You set-top box. Now, they're being very, very bizarre about what TVs they're allowing it on. So most manufacturers are saying only their 2014 range. There is absolutely no technical reason that Freeview Plus or HBB TV 1.5, which is the platform Freeview Plus works on, could not be enabled on most TVs from, say, 2011 or 2012 onwards. So the dream scenario here is that you'll be able to watch TV as you normally do. You'll also be able to, to time shift TV, so stop, pause, rewind, but then also have access to go into their, their native kind of catch-up services and do that all within the space of your television. And there's more you can do with it. There's, you know, imagine sort of a you've come in halfway through a show, but there's already a catch-up licence for it. Just click the button to say watch from the beginning. So it's really taking a lot of technology, a lot of infrastructure that already exists and kind of seamlessly blending it with that TV experience well, so you don't need any more. Seamlessly. Yeah. In, I said in a dream world, yeah. in the magical dream world, as operated time, by unicorns. This is the time where Channel 7 and Channel 9 are extending their ad breaks from 13 minutes per show to 20 minutes per show. Trying to. Tr trying to. <laughs> I just, again, they're trying to get people to sit down in front of their TVs and... While TV is a very passive experience, this whole interactivity and having to go between different portals to access catch up and whether you go on your computer or, you know, your television or your remote control, like it all just seems a bit much and a bit overwhelming. <laughs> and like we already have... Do you need to lie down? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I just feel like, you know, we're investing in an MBN which isn't going to be fast enough to meet this need. So you do need cable and you do need particular speeds in order to get a decent Freeview service in the first place. There's much easier ways of accessing it than using Freeview that already exist that are probably less expensive for you in the long run because you have to invest in a new television in order to, to get access to this service. And given that most Australians on average buy a new TV every five years, by the time the new TV comes around, I don't even know if Freeview is going to be relevant anymore. The other interesting element here is that each of the different networks uh, have invested heavily in their own kind of social media apps where you can engage with shows, Beamly and Zbox and a Fango, bunch of other ones. Fango. 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 They all sound like Terrible. things a baby Venereal burps diseases. up yeah. when you feed them too or many Portuguese pears. Restaurants. Or Portuguese restaurants. Or Portuguese restaurants. <laughs> the, why didn't they push harder to have those apps integrated into the system? Because you would have thought there was a lot of value for each of the networks in having their social media networks hooked into televisions themselves. They were initially looking at what the advertising was going to be before they went into the social stuff. Right. They're looking at good integrated directed advertising before they start thinking about the social. Curious, globally, if you look at other countries around the world, other television markets, 
where has this stuff taken hold really effectively? A, a seamless, let, again, I'm going to persist with the word seamless as though it's a thing. Bear with me. Where have other countries gone really right in this space? France? Japan, Korea. Japan, Korea. What are they France doing? France and Germany. France and Germany. All right. Take if, me on an international tour. Uh, first to Asia. Which I ones? Mean, if you're talking about social integration, there are cinemas in China and in Japan at the moment where they literally run the tweets of people about the movies across the screen while you're watching the movie. That sounds like hell. I'm Let exactly. alone that like TV hell. I yeah. mean, it, it, visually it looks just like a massive epilepsy fit, but I mean, they're already so far advanced, they're putting tweets on movie screens. We can't even get our social networks to hook into our free view platforms properly. Like, it just doesn't really feel like we're approaching this in a way that is both financially efficient and realistic for what audiences are doing now, not what they hope that they will still be doing in five to ten years' time. All right. France, Germany? A uh, little less on the social, but more because um, you know, basically on HBB TV, it's uh, just anything can be delivered via HTML, can be superimposed over your TV screen. So they're doing news alerts on demand, weather on demand, in addition to all this catch up stuff. Um, I think it's been really quite well done over there. So where is subscription TV and all this? Because a lot of the functionality we're talking about with uh, Freeview Plus, Foxtel IQ has had for a while. You could do catch up, you could do all these things already. I mean, what's the, what's the subscription industry thinking as they're looking at all this? Well, that's a really good question, actually. And interestingly, it's the Astra subscription TV conference today. And just as part of the keynote, Foxtel announced that they were slashing the price uh, of their entry level Foxtel. Um, so they're obviously making a big push to get people on board with subscription subscription TV, they have a surprisingly low footprint given how much money they generate, which is an absurd amount of cash, and how mm. much power they have over what they can show and when it's shown. Um, I think maybe they're looking at Freeview Plus and just thinking, is something else catching up? Do we need to be innovating? Anything that lowers the cost of subscription TV, I'm, I'm all for. I'd be surprised if we didn't see some kind of equivalent of the Comcast Time Warner arrangement where our cable provider Foxtel more closely partners with either Telstra or mm. a number of other telcos. Um, it's interesting what you're saying about Foxtel diminishing in the recent past because I think Foxtel has quite a good layout when it comes to like the actual software that you use to navigate TV shows. It's very basic. It hasn't changed in years, but it works. I think the problem for cable TV in Australia is content and the price of content and, and accessibility. And I think cable is more likely to be successful if the cost of shows drops and people can either pay per show or pay per episode for whatever that they want. And that means not putting a stop on things like Game of Thrones and ensuring that there are legitimate entry points for people to pay for content instead of pirating it. Mm. But failing that, I can't see how some kind of telco land grab isn't on the horizon in the next five to 10 years. All right. So paint a picture for me. Five years time. What's the dominant platform we're watching TV on our TVs? I think it'll still be around HBB TV. I think, you know, it'll be a, a later iteration of it, but I think it's got a lot of legs. And again, you know, Claire was right before, some of it's to do with what our broadband's going to look like. But, you know, if you could be just really easily accessing, say you want to watch a movie, you just search for that movie, it finds all of the subscription services and all of the non-subscription services you might be allied to. It'll just offer you like multiple choices of that movie at multiple price points. You pick the one you like. That's great. I think it's heavily dependent on how the NBN is going to land up looking. Um, in the US, cable is really dependent on your geography and your internet is really dependent on your geography and the content that you can get depends on where in across that continent you're living and the broadband and, and fibre access at that point. Hopefully in Australia we're not going to have that problem, but because we still don't really know what the hell is happening with the NBN, we're still not really going to know at least for another, I'd say, year, 18 months, if not longer, as to what those business partnerships are going to look like once wholesaling actually kicks off for, in earnest. All right. That is HBB TV or Freeview Plus. No doubt we'll be looking at that as it rolls out. Now, next up on the show, you can't not talk about it. It's been known as the fappening. Terrible term. We didn't come up with it. Uh, hundreds of images of female celebrities nude leaked online onto the website 4chan. Um, now, there's been a lot of misinformation about this, including some from very well-known news outlets like CNN. Do we even know who is this 4chan? 
it, person or website. He may, and I'm of course, sure 4chan is, is not a person. It is a website, and that was the technology analyst talking at the end there. Very impressive. All right, now we record the show on a Thursday. At this point, uh, up until this point, we're operating off the assumption that there was a error in iCloud, which of course is Apple's backup service that would allow somebody to use a bit of brute force script. So to explain what that means, um, normally when you try and log on to someone's account. I assume you do it just like that. Uh, if you don't do it, uh, if you don't get the right password after five times, you get locked out. Bit of brute force script theoretically would allow you to scroll through hundreds of different passwords until you get the right one. We had been operating off the assumption that that was what was involved in breaking this down. But what we've worked out now is that Apple have put out a statement saying it absolutely was an iCloud. They haven't actually come out and said what the issue is, but they've denied 100% that they are responsible for this leak. There was a leak last night on Reddit and Imja claiming the existence of a ring, a very small and exclusive ring of quite uh, wealthy photo traders who have been accessing naked photos of celebrities for some time and trading them within a group of about five to seven people. It's thought that there are more arrests coming in the coming days, uh, that it wasn't just one person. There is a suggestion that maybe someone got hold of an iTunes password and then simply just used that password to access an account and to get into their photo stream and then import or export photos out of the cloud. Um, and have then traded them with other people who've managed to do the same. All right. Well, we should say again that this is a very time-specific conversation. We are having it on Thursday. Undoubtedly, news will change between now and then, which is why, by the way, you should listen to the show the moment it goes up. Nick, uh, what's your thoughts? What, what's looking like the most likely scenario to you at this exact moment in time? Well, look, I'm not going to deny what Apple's saying. They say it was a very targeted attack directly against those people who had stuff stolen. But what is definite, and it has been reported by a lot of white hat groups, is that the main exploit they were using was around... Um, find my device, that it doesn't have a lockout of passwords, or it didn't, it does now. It does now. It, it used Ooh, it to take now. as many <laughs> attempts as you wanted on the basis that people would probably just want to find their device. Yeah. But it's usually the same password as your Apple ID, and once you've got that, you've got access to pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. And people were saying that it was basically around just the fight, they were brute forcing it using a Python script with the 500 most popular passwords. Which is an astonishing list. Uh, after, the, I think, the last big uh, password hack that came out, I think, at the end of last year, they released this list of the most popular passwords and it is exactly as ridiculous as you uh, think it is. It's a lot of horrifying. password, one, two, three, four. Princess was a really big one and Jesus was a really big one. Uh, is oh, there that's a, nice there to know he's still yeah. big. That's yeah. good. Jesus yeah. is big in your password. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> even though iCloud may or may not be responsible, there is an effect on Apple as a brand here. What do you think that effect's going to be, Claire? I think it's temporary. Yeah? Yeah. You know, yes, in the short term, maybe Apple should take some action, but Honestly, like we see things like this happen fairly frequently in our industry. I've yet to see consumer behaviour change pro at all. Can I make a controversial point, though, about these leaks? Absolutely. While I think it's really great that um, people like yourself and myself and Luke Hopewell from Gizmodo and Alex Kidman from uh, Fat Duck Tech and Lifehacker, you know, they've all written these great op-ed pieces appealing to people's better nature, asking them not to look at the photos, claiming that if you claim to believe in privacy, you therefore must respect the privacy of others and in don't doing click. so, Absolutely. don't click. And don't click on articles promising to show you even blurred photos either mm. because it's still invasion of privacy. Totally valid point. Would we be acting the same if it was Miley Cyrus and not Jennifer Lawrence? Because there does seem to be a contradiction in terms that Jennifer Lawrence is a really nice person. She doesn't have the sort of risque persona as someone like Britney Spears or Miley. And so everyone's like, won't somebody think of the celebrities? But then you've got someone like Anita Sarkeesian who had the decency of being female and talking about video games at the same time and mm. she can't live in her own house for fear of her own safety. There just seems to be a real contradiction in the way that we approach uh, misogyny or sex Depending on how much we like the celebrity in question, you know what? I think you're probably 100% correct. I think the fact that Jennifer Lawrence is beloved by everyone and I want her to be my best friend uh, probably does have an impact on people, which is awful. I, really, it should be about the principle of it. I don't know how much I agree, to be honest. Um, I think the fact that, uh, you know, you've even got a Reddit, bloody subreddit, whatever it is, uh, dedicated to calling this the fappening because they're talking about how much they're getting their rocks off over the whole thing. Yeah, I should is say it... we didn't come up with that term. That is, no, <laughs> that is, they did it and an then they did term. posters for it. It's this pervasive misogyny. I think they're identical. I don't think that this is only because uh, it's, it's someone who's popular. I think it's still the same people who wouldn't be okay with it, no matter who it was, saying they're not okay with it. Everyone else is still okay with it. What 
what celebrities or anyone wants to do with their smartphones in their private life is their business. Like, yeah. I, I refuse Absolutely. to get into shaming territory, Absolutely. which is, you know, I don't want our listeners or our, our viewers to in any way misinterpret what we're saying. You want to take nudie pics? By all means, go for it. Go right ahead. 100%. Percent. Yeah. And actually, you know, this is the other element. Every second that somebody goes up on TV and radio and says, well, why are these people taking their photos in the first place is another second we should be putting into. This is an invasion of privacy. Yeah. Exactly. You should be able to do this stuff on your device and have a reasonable expectation that it will remain private. And anything beyond that is actually just unfair and victim shaming. And I think that as a conversation as well. It's been really interesting in the last week as well, Claire. There is a point to say, you know, if you're going to take a nude pic, probably best take it, send it to whoever you want to send it to and delete it off your phone before you do anything else. Mm. Unless your iCloud automatically backs it up because you happen to be in Wi-Fi at home. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Or if you do want to keep them. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's the other thing, of course. I also think maybe it shows people need to really learn what it means to back up to the cloud. I'm more than certain that what happens most often is that you take a photo, you delete it from your phone, you then back your phone up to your cloud, you think you've deleted the photo from the cloud, but that you've just deleted it, you're it just from your phone. replacing yeah. the photo in the same place that you've just deleted it from every time you back up. Hmm. Or if you've plugged it into your iTunes and you haven't backed up your iTunes and then you back up from your iTunes to the cloud, the same thing kind of happens. So I think people really need to learn what it actually means. Also to delete a photo, you don't, when you delete a photo, that photo doesn't disappear. That file is simply marked by the software as deleted. And even if, I mean, there are certain ways to scramble that file Mm. and make sure that if it is in existence somewhere, somewhere down the line, if someone tries to find it, it'll be pixels of nipple or something. Yeah. Um, But that file is never gone. So that's something people need to realise as well. Deleting doesn't mean delete. It just means it's being marked as a different file to one that's open. Can I just play devil's advocate here for a second with regards to uh, people like the three of us saying you shouldn't click on these articles? If we were talking about piracy and just saying you shouldn't download these things on principle because it's stealing, what's the difference in the arguments there? You shouldn't download content that you can pay for. But if you cannot access content and the only way for you to view it is through piracy, I've struggled to find an argument to that because, you know, if you look at a site like canIWatchIt.com.au, which actually monitors um, what pirated content is being viewed at any given time in Australia, as of this morning, 70% of the content that is pirated in Australia is not available for legitimate purchase in this country. Even a show like Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip by Aaron Sorkin, that show has been cancelled for 10 years. You cannot buy it in JB Hi-Fi, you cannot buy it on Amazon, you cannot stream it legitimately. If you use a VPN, you can pay for it, but other than that, like it's actually not available for legitimate purchase in Australia. So I don't really have a lot of sympathy when someone goes to Pirate Bay. All right, what about you? The, the, the I principal think argument. two wildly different debates. Okay. There's so? piracy, which could be theft, might not. You wouldn't download a car. I don't know, all of that rubbish. <laughs> and then there's endemic and systemic misogyny and male entitlement that is pervasive throughout culture and what is rapidly becoming something that feels like an actual war on women. Mm. And I think they are very, very different things. What he said. All right. And if you are more interested in this area, the media report on RN are doing a very detailed piece about the changes we've seen in celebrity coverage in the last half decade or so. Really, really interesting program. Absolutely look it up on the RN website. Mark Fennell is my name this Right now is download this show, which I've just realised now because it's a linear format. You probably already knew because you've been watching it for 13 minutes. But let me reintroduce our panel anyway. Nick Healy is from CNET and Claire Porter is from techly.com.au and PC Mag. And in all the conversation we've been having about backing things up, uh, I want to talk about a really interesting uh, gadget that's crowdsourcing right now on the website Indiegogo. It's called Bleep. The idea is you plug it into your phone. It charges your phone, but it also backs up your phone at the same time. Nick, just kind of paint a picture for me exactly what this would look like as I started using it. So basically it's a um, standard kind of USB thumb drive and a good little app that works with that thumb drive. So when you know your phone detects it's plugged in, the app goes through and backs everything up to that solid state storage. And at the same time it's charging? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Why hasn't this idea been thought of before? Although you you, you seem less convinced about it. Yeah, no, I can see this. So sceptical about this. Yeah, Love why? It. Tell me why you're sceptical. I I find it very problematic because people now have to be really possessive and concerned about their charging cable. You know, I think one of the most common phrases of the 21st century is, hey, do you have a charger I can borrow? Mm. But now whenever you're charging your phone, 
like, A, you're worried about who has your backup and mm. who has access to that information. But what happens when someone else charges their phone using that cable? Does their phone automatically back up? Does it replace your backup? Surely there's... Where is it backing up not to? Not if they don't cloud? have the app. Yeah, surely, surely it's de- slightly dependent on the app, I would imagine. Okay, so you have to download the app in order yeah. for that solid state yeah, yeah. to back up at Absolutely. all? Absolutely. It's the app that tell All the solid state is is just the plain storage. It's the app that does all the heavy lifting. I mean, I'm all for, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of like solid state hard drives. I, I'm a little sceptical of the cloud at the best of times. Mm. I only store kind of things like, you Fat know, photos. my notes off my phone, like stuff that I really yeah. wouldn't care if... It was stolen. Yeah. Um, whereas my really important stuff is backed up to hardware. But that's kind of why I'm a little concerned that something as small and nimble as, as this uh, cable can hold your entire phone's data. I just think it changes the way that we're interacting with our personal information. And it's just yet another thing people have to be worried about. Mm. I think it just depends on how you use it. I think, you know... Sure, you've got different cables for work and bits and pieces, but nearly everyone has something to charge their phone directly beside their bed. That's what this one is. It never moves from there. It's the cable that is plugged in permanently right beside where you sleep. I know I just said that I'm sceptical of the cloud, but I was a little surprised that it wasn't like a dongle that like backed it up wirelessly to the cloud rather than storing it in solid state. Yeah, I think this is good. I think this is perfect from what we've just been talking about. <laughs> yeah. It's just another way of doing it. A lot of people don't back up. You know, if you're not on an iOS device, your backup options can be reasonably limited or it's basically photos to Dropbox and things like that. I mean, Google have a pretty good service, but not everyone really understands what it's doing. I think this is really, you know, for the money they're asking, which is not much at the all. The money's reasonable. Mm. I just, mm, I'd feel a little weird about using it. All right. Would you ever want to use Bleep? Let us know in the comment section down below if you happen to be on YouTube. And if I didn't say it already at the beginning of the show, you should absolutely subscribe. There'll be a button somewhere around here. Just hit subscribe. Tons of amazing content comes from RN every week. If you're watching an iView... That is good. You should enjoy that. And then you should go to YouTube and subscribe. Easy. All right. Very big thank you to our panel this week. Nick Healy from CNET. Thanks so much for coming back. Thanks for having me on. And Claire Porter, who is the editor of PC Mag Australia and from techly.com.au. Thank you so much for coming back. It's been great being here. And as always, thank you for watching another episode of Download This Show.